Uh, all right, so yeah, let's get let's get started and welcome to a guided tour to 80s retro gaming. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, 80s 80s computer games and, and playing them now in in 2020. Um, uh, I guess before we get started in talking about the, the the topic at hand of, of, of 80s 80s computer games, um, we can introduce our our tour guides for the for the next hour, um, our, our lovely panelists, and let us know what what of what 80s home computers you you grew up with and what's your relationship to these to these systems that we're we're talking about. Um, uh, Jesse, would you would you like to to start? Uh, sure. Uh, so I'm an adjunct at the Game Center, and I teach a class on American computer games of the 80s, is the class that's probably most relevant here, along with some tabletop and info classes. Uh, and I, I mean, the relevance to me is very straightforward. I grew up with these. I grew up in a essentially middle class household, so we never had the cutting edge thing. But as soon as, so, as soon as Commodore crushed some other computer, I would bet it in the fire sale. And so I had a, a TI 99 and an Atari 800. And my dad had the only uh, PC clone that was actually slower than IBM PC. So, you know, I uh, had experience with, with an, uh, an end of this stuff uh, that, and then. And just you know, kept kept up an interest uh, as I got older uh, through the '90s and so on. Um, and uh, Ben, how about, how about yourself? Uh, yeah, so uh, like all my colleagues here, I uh, teach classes at the NYU Game Center, and uh, you know, I, I I guess I have taught a class on retro gaming with uh, with Clara, uh, focusing on European games. Uh, it's sort of a lifelong interest of mine, uh, playing games from all different systems. But the ones that I grew up with, I guess through the '80s, through the mid '80s. Um, the ZX Spectrum, the Sinclair ZX Spectrum, a, a British 8-bit uh, computer. Uh, and then come the end of the 80s, maybe 88, 89, our family got a Commodore Amiga, a uh, 16-bit computer. Uh, so those were the two things that I spent the most time on. But I was one of those kids who, uh, you know, whenever I saw any kind of computer, even if it was worse than the ones we had at home, I just, I just kind of magnetized to it. So, so for me, like, yeah, it was a little bit of everything. Uh, and uh, uh, Clara, uh, Ben had mentioned uh, the class that you, you co-taught together. Yes, yeah, so I'm also faculty at the NYU Game Center, and yes, Ben and I taught the one class, probably worldwide, on European games of the 80s, so not specifically. Um, of course, we'll be talking a bit about those. Uh, I grew up with the MSX uh, platform. I had an MSX and then an MSX2. Those were the ones that we had at home, and the platform I'll be talking about. Uh, and then my uncle had the uh, ZX Spectrum that he built from a kit. Uh, so, so those were the ones I had the most access to. Um, also in the neighborhood, whenever anybody bought a computer, they called my dad or me, even though I was very little, because we apparently knew how to read the manual. Um, so, so yeah, like I, I uh, fiddled a bit with uh, computers like the Amstrad CPC, for example. So, but yeah, my, my, my um, experience is mostly with the MSX. And uh, Naomi Clark, uh, how, about, how about yourself? Yeah, although I also teach classes at the NYU Game Center, I think I'm um, one of the few people here who has not taught a class on uh, on retro gaming. Uh, I think my my expertise primarily comes yeah from my childhood. Uh, I I remember getting our first like family computer. Uh, I think in 1983 it was Apple IIe, and that was my computer growing up. Um, Initially, we had it in our living room, and then eventually I kind of just dragged it into my bedroom uh, since nobody else was using it. And I, I don't know, I learned how to program in basic on that thing. Uh, by the very end of the 80s, I think we also had a, um, one of the early generation Macs in the 80s and then into the 90s. I got my own, um, I got my own Macintosh, like Power Mac at the end of the 90s. But really for, yeah, the, all of the 80s, I was playing games on that Apple IIe. And fortunately, I had a, um, an aunt who was a software pirate. And she, when we got an Apple IIe, which she had convinced our family to buy, uh, she, she sent me a giant shoebox full of floppy disks, like about this many floppy disks. And so I spent a long, I spent years, literally years, just sort of going through the floppy disks and being like, okay, let me try this one. Let me see what's on this one. So it was just a constant um, series of mysteries unfolding. And I, I think we, we bought very little software and it was pretty expensive <laughs> to, if you wanted to have a big software library. So I was lucky that I got exposed to a lot of games that way. Hmm. Uh, and my name is Alexander King, and I also am um, an adjunct professor at the NYU Game Center. And I, I, I'm like a just a, like a uh, maybe five, five years too young to to have grown up with some of these uh, systems. Um, but I had an original Macintosh was my um, like a, the, the computer that we had in our in our basement. Um, and, um, but it was actually only later, like in, in as an adult trying to find games that I played as a kid, that I realized that it, growing up in, in the UK, that a lot of the games that I played well into the 90s were on uh, Amigas. 
uh, or uh, the Acorn Archimedes, I realized was like, oh, that was like the, the computer that both of the schools, that, you know, that that's what were in the computer labs and that's what, where, what, where all those games came from. Um, and so yeah, so, so most of these, most of these um, computer systems I kind of came to uh, later in life to, 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 to find. And that's who, and that's who we're, we're, we're talking to, right, is, is um, uh, assuming, assuming people are not familiar with these, with these sort of, sort of systems. Um, I guess before jumping into that, the like, uh, it's sort of like, it's, it's kind of a coincidence that we, we all teach a thing like Game Center. It's like not a, it's not a Game Center panel. It just, just like, that's just how I, you know, know you all and know, we know each other. Um, but it's also not a coincidence in that, I guess, like, uh, as you mentioned, there, there are classes at the Game Center um, that, that, that are about that. So I guess for, if, if for, for people who, who, who teach, you know, game designers, teach future game designers, is there something about older games that are worth looking at in, in particular, and particularly old computer games um, that you found in, in any of your, your teaching practices? I think for me, um, the the most useful thing uh, is, is just that a lot of old computer games, even ones that were extremely popular back in the uh, 80s or 90s, uh, have kind of been on on evolutionary branches of, of game design that died away. Uh, you know, that we were extremely popular in the day, and then um, perhaps uh, the you know something from the arcade or from the consoles became the more of the sort of standard design. And uh, so there's a lot of ideas back back there that are kind of interesting and and, and successful in their own context. Uh, but have been forgotten. So you know, just like if you're writing a pop song, you might go and listen to some uh, jazz records from the '60s for ideas that have been forgotten. Get something kind of freshen it up. Uh, there's a lot of inspiration to be found in in those in those particular games. And I think also because they tended to be made by smaller companies or individuals, there's a lot more idiosyncratic games. Uh, game, games with really kind of strange or or kind of from our point of view, uh, unexpected aspects. So for me, that's that's the entire appeal. Yeah, and if I can piggyback on that a bit. This part of it where like there were no bounds to imagination that were the, the conventions were being invented back then so that's one of the fun things to see uh, you know games about you know going to see penguins we're going to see i don't know if we have any about lawnmowers but there are games about lawnmowers for example uh miners you know things like those yeah i think a lot of parallels can be found between our game design students and these older games because they're both operating under constraints uh mm -hmm. and there's not a lot of the, the, if there's a generation gap or if there's anything they kind of have to uh, cast and come over, I think it's much less the games themselves, which can be janky uh, or, uh, you know, a little cryptic or obtuse, but they, they play test their friends' games. Like, this is not new to that. But I think the games themselves, uh, certainly dabbling in them. And, you know, when I teach that uh, American Computer Games the 80s class, you know, I try to show people like a dozen games a week and just if they can find one uh, that they kind of click with and want to go deep on, that to me is a success, right? So yeah, so I think that's a, a good sort of um, transition point to talking about what, what exactly we're, we're talking about. And since I think I, I've actually been really impressed the last couple of years, the way that like retro gaming has kind of spread to, to a wider kind of games, games culture and that, um, but, but computer games are, are still a little obscure, I think in part because we're, we're used to the idea that there are different consoles and then as now there were, were different consoles. Um, but this idea that there are all of these different computer systems, none of which exist today <laughs> is, is I think the, the kind of harder, harder thing. And, and one of the, the, the impetus for this, this talk was like, the way that people kind of like back project DOS and Windows into the into the 80s and and like refer to oh, old PC games and, and stuff when in fact like the the Wintel IBM PC DOS so that that architecture was like a, like one of the worst platforms for, for games in, in the in actual 80s it's not until the 90s and, and stuff that those, those get better um, but as a result I think makes people kind of unaware of them um, uh, uh, today um, so uh, that's kind of the, the, the period that we're, we're talking about these, in these, these systems. And there is something yeah. about the, the fact that the, the, the thing that is playing the game is, is also the tool that, that makes it. Um, I know in, in, your, in your book, I mean, in, in a, a game design vocabulary, you talk about like, these are the, a lot of the first, first games that have level editors and, and stuff and, and playing, um, is, it, is it Load Runner is the? Uh, yeah, Load Runner uh, was what I did a lot of my first level design on. It's true, I think of all sort of uh, 80s kids. And uh, yeah, it's, yeah, I think there was a sense even back when I was a kid, I was somehow being a little bit closer to the people that were making the game, mm. right? So uh, for me, that was this almost like zine-like thing that really ties in with what Jesse was talking about as a hobbyist market, right? That the, the people the creators are talking to are often, they're, they're fellow hobbyists. Mm. They may not be you know, software developers in the same way, but they're kind of like part of the same crowd. Mm. Uh, and so when I was, you know, I was like barely a teenager by the, by the end of this era, uh, and I was only a member of this club because my friends and I figured out how to just copy games, right? We were, we, it's just, it was just like with cassette tapes um, or, or anything else, right? Just 
were making copies of stuff being like, oh, check this thing out, right? And you, you get this mysterious floppy disk and you have no idea what's on it and you have to see whether it'll run on your machine. Uh, and, uh, and then when you do, you get like a weird letter from somewhere, right? From somewhere in California or in Europe or who knows where that like somebody's made this thing. You have no idea how it's supposed to work. And often like without any kind of packaging or commercial apparatus surrounding it, right? Which is, I feel like really light years from where we are today, even with indie games, there was like almost no presentation in the way that I encountered these games, right? It's just like a black disc, no, it's not even a manual, like at least the way that I got them. Mm. So for, for people in the, in the present, um, you, g going back and, and playing these games, um, you know, are there, are there any specific uh, or any kind of general, general tips that, that, that work for, for, for people like it? So stuff that people should be aware of as they're, as they're playing these, these games? Well, I mean, the, the first thing is that you often have to read a manual, right? I mean, for a computer game, the presumption is that you're coming to it without openness to do some work. Uh, it's not going to tutorialize you. It's not necessarily going to tell you all the buttons. There might be a strange procedure for loading it up that's different than every other game. You can still get those manuals. They're almost all captured and, and stored online somewhere, but often not with the actual game media. So it's not like a NES game you just pop in a ROM and they all have the same interface, mm -hmm. uh, especially old 8-bit computer games. Uh, all have their own keyboard layout. They have different support for controllers. It can, be, it can really be different. You know, I, I think you need to come to it with, with a readiness to do a little bit more work uh, to be able to kind of extract the goodness out of the games. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's a, a great, there is this sort of like a, a barrier to entry to, to starting games that is, is not instantaneous, like like with some some console games, but it, it's usually like, uh, you know, it's, it's not too bad it's, to, to, as, we're, as we're enticing people. It's, it is one of those things once you kind of get, get Past the, you know, there's you, you've got to kind of orient yourself to it a, a little bit. Um, uh, I think I think it can be pretty bad, but the, the <laughs> yeah. right way to frame it in your mind is it's like it's like an ancient Mayan tomb, and there's treasure inside, but there's also poison darts and like rolling rocks and and you know skeletons everywhere. And uh, if you can figure out your way through that, you can get something that nobody else can get. So it's a way to have a kind of a boutique experience. Mm -hmm. I have a I special mean, relationship to this because the. Um, it took me literally years of my childhood to figure out how to play some Apple II games because I never had access to any manuals, right? I had to figure everything out by trial and error. It's like playing an experimental game these days, right? Where it's just like, you don't know what the buttons do. You just have to, you don't even know like what the goal of the game is or anything. Um, but there's no, there's no substitution for an experience like that. Uh, and I would almost say, like, I would almost encourage people, like, at least with some, with some games, like, try, try to see if you can just figure it out from scratch, because it's, it is enormously frustrating. And then when you figure it out, it is, it's quite, uh, it's quite an unusual <laughs> sensation, but I just had no alternative. And so I would get frustrated. I would stop. I would come back to a game maybe a week later to be like, can I, can I figure that one out again? And so it's good that I had like a big stack of pirated games. Yeah. Like, like Naomi, all of our games were pirated because I'm from Australia and Australia is one of the worst piracy countries in the world. Um, we're second. Yeah. Spain, <laughs> Spain is up there as well. And, uh, you know, I, I, we, that meant that we often didn't have the manual. And so yeah. it really was like a, a process of just trying to extract the smallest little morsel of fun out of something yeah. that was this black box. So I had the same experience. Um, I do think, I mean, I just wanted to, because I, I guess I was the one person who did grow up with the manuals. I didn't have a lot of the games, but I basically did uh, later when uh, I had access to an Amiga through my stepfather at a lot of pirated games, I had kind of that same experience. Uh, but with the Atari 800, it was like, well, I would save up for a few months and I'd buy Ultima 4 or whatever. And that came in a huge box with a cloth map and a metal onk and three different books that had like some sort of snakeskin kind of cover with runes on it. And like that was at least as much a part of the experience as what the zeros and ones. But yeah, I do think that Bennett, I think, sees it more as a burden. I see it more as like part of the pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's certainly, I think, most of the games I listed are ones that aren't very manual oriented. They are more arcadey, pop in and play. Uh, but if you're interested in the RPGs or the adventure games, I would just, I would embrace it as being just as much a part of the game uh, mm -hmm. because it is. Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. The good news is that all of those materials pretty much have been scanned and, and put online and the internet archive has like nearly everything and you can just print out the manual and get a little bit of that flavor or, you know, it, it definitely is worth doing. If you're, if you're going to play the strategy games and the RPGs, mm -hmm. Jesse's saying, uh, find the materials for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, so as we, uh, I think that's a good good transition to talking about the, the games them, themselves. Um, so we've got so many different recommendations um, uh, to go through. Uh, I, I put it on a uh, on a on a, a website uh, real quick um, at sites.google.com slash nyu.edu slash 80s games, uh, where I'm going to list all of the all of the recommendations we're making uh, and, and, and link out to, to some resources as well. Something we're not talking about is how every single one of these platforms has a completely different emulator, uh, some of which are much easier to use than, than others. Um, so I wanted to consolidate some of 
that um, uh, onto onto an external external uh, uh, reference um, and uh, and consolidate some of the, the recommendations we we had that didn't make it into the uh, into the talk as, as well. Um, so yeah, so let's let's dive into talking about some of these these particular uh, platforms um, and and the the, the uh, uh, kind of guided tour of some of the games on them. Um, and so I, I asked each of you about uh, uh, some particular platforms and what games would be good for uh, somebody in the present to go back and play and experience this platform. So th this uh, this is a different kind of curated list, right? Like this isn't I, these are not the most commercially successful or most influential from these these platforms. These wouldn't be on the the best of list necessarily. These are ones that like today you could go and play and would give you a good sense of the platform. That might be slightly different than what was most popular or most successful uh, in the in the period itself. Uh, so I think first up we've got the Commodore 64, and and for each of our platforms I have I have a, an air commercial to kind of set our mood real quick. Uh, so let me let me cue that up. I'm all alive. Perfect, perfect. Uh, great, great lead in uh, for, for one of the most uh, successful, yeah. successful platforms. Um, uh, so, okay, so, so Jesse, you, you uh, gave us a, a, number, a number of these. Um, so why don't you, you I'll, I'll cue them up and, and you tell us about mm -hmm. some of these recommendations that you made. I, I think first up is, uh, is Space Taxi. Yeah, I think Space Taxi is just a really fun, accessible game. It's in the lunar lander kind of gravity. You're a taxi, you know, you're going to fall unless you push the thrusters and those are, uh, it's crazy taxi. So, like you're landing, you're picking people up. There's a great little voice, hey, taxi. And, you know, then you take them to where you go. And it's just remarkably modern. Like there's 24 different levels. They're very varied. They have different kind of puzzles. You can access them in different, like the easy, medium, and late shift. There's, you can randomize it. Like it really, in a way that games from the early 80s normally do not try to do at all, uh, is trying to make itself accessible to kind of all skill levels. Uh, mm. And yeah, it's, it's just fun. <laughs> and and then and a very different uh, vibe is, is below the below the root your your second recommendation. Yeah, I want to recommend something in the RPG ish vein, but to stay away from the really heavy kind of grindy stuff. Uh, and this is a game actually co-made by uh, Dale Disharoon and Zolpakitli Snyder, and it is a canonical sequel to Snyder's trilogy, the Green Sky trilogy, which is uh, and I mean this in the best possible way, essentially YA Ursula K. Le Guin. Like that that's the vibe. It's very good. Uh, I read them last summer because I want to play this game. And you don't need to, though. It, and it's basically an action RPG graphic adventure, uh, a really nice original setting. And because it was kind of a game aimed at kids, uh, one secret is 80s games came to kids, at least they thought about the UI and they play tested it uh, in a way that they often did not do for adults. Uh, mm. So yeah, this is a, a fun one that you could play for a few hours and kind of get the feel for it. Uh, this is Castles of Dr. Creep, which again, not an all-timer by any means, although a big influence on Prince of Persia, uh, which I would, if you were to play an 80s version, I guess I'd play the Apple II one. But I think, again, very accessible to this and surprising, like, it actually is the first game I've ever seen to tutorialize, like, every kind of obstacle by putting you in a room. And it's like, mm. this is how the teleporter works. And there's a little sample puzzle that's trivial to solve where you use the teleporter and so on and so forth. But, yeah, I mean, uh, don't really need the instruction manual. Mm. Uh, and it has an interesting co op -y puzzle mode that is fun with two people. And yeah, just a, a fairly accessible game. The, the co-op mode, I strongly recommend. It's, it's much harsher and, and meaner than a modern co-op game, but it's, it's a ton of fun. And I, 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 played, I came to this game recently. Uh, so it's, it's no nostalgia here. It's just, it's just a good time. And I think uh, this was one of uh, uh, your recommendations, Bennett, uh, is uh, IK+. Yeah, um, so this is a game by Archer McLean, who uh, cut his teeth on the uh, Atari 8-bit platform. It's a British developer. Um, and I think, uh, so, so this, is, this is IK Plus, Inter International Karate Plus is a sequel to International Karate. I think they got sued by the makers of Karate Champ, uh, Data East, uh, but it's not really anything like Karate Champ. This is, a, this is a game you play with one joystick and one button. And I think what's significant about it is it's like a one hit kill fighting game uh, with, with, where it's designed for a kind of flowing movement where you flow mm. from one attack into another by kind of rolling the joystick around the outside. And if you're playing it well, your, your, your little guy is just always in motion in a way that uh, is not matched by contemporary fighting games. And mm. so uh, of all of the old 8-bit uh, and 16-bit fighting games, this is the one that is most different in mm. my mind than, uh, than the kind of Street Fighter template that's, that's, that's overwhelmingly popular now. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it still runs well. It's, you know, runs a good enough frame rate and, uh, you know, kind of responsive enough that a contemporary player can, can enjoy it and get good at it. Mm. And you had also recommended uh, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, which is uh, like a, a cult classic on, on the platform. Do you want to tell us about that one as well? Yeah, this, is, uh, this, was, this was commissioned by the, by the band, Frank, Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Um, 
and it's a it's a kind of a psychedelic game. One of one of the, uh, the first, even though it was done under this kind of weird contract work commission situation, you, you're walking around these houses. This is a good one to play without the manual uh, mm. because in the first instance, you're walking around a village and invading people's houses and rifling through their drawers and stealing their drugs. But once it starts to actually occur to you what the what the kind of payoff in this game is, it's going to blow your mind. I don't want to ruin it more than that. It's it is such a trip. Mm. Uh, so yeah, uh, 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 recommend yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, yes. I, I think a, a favorite of, of, of a lot of ours of, of, this, of this platform. Um, so yeah, a, a quick quick intro to the to the Commodore sixty four. There's there's many 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 other other games on, on the platform. Um, but as a, as a place to start, I think so these are good good uh, games for for the modern the modern player to to, to check out. Um, our our next system is a, like the an, another very popular and has a huge uh, library is the is the ZX Spectrum, um, which I also have a it's a, one of its famous commercials. Um, <laughs> Professional keyboard. I like that. That's the that's the that's the top of the. What's the worst, by the way? Because it was yeah. made of rubber. Like, you get like sticky. So, so they're like it now has a keyboard. Is the uh, is the advertisement? Yeah, Bob um, and yeah, and the Spectrum is an interesting one. That it's so much, it's more console-like than than uh, since it was it was like a, such a mass market. I, I think the, the original was was ninety nine pounds. It, it was like a, a you know a more widespread, and, and the games are smaller and, and kind of more 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 console-like. Um, so we have a few recommendations um, uh, for the uh, first is uh, Alien Eight, and this was a recommendation of yours, Bennett. Yeah, this is um, this is actually a a, a sequel, um, but it's it's one of the early games by. Uh, by Ultimate Play the Game, who went on to become a rare, um, very you know, famous uh, maker of games like Goldeneye on the N64, Perfect Dark. Uh, but when they were breaking through, they were making these isometric 3D games in a way that nobody else had figured out how to do. It's a perfect example of a game that's best to play on the Spectrum. It had slightly faster CPU, which made the uh, 3D uh, work better than it did on uh, systems with better uh, graphical capabilities generally, like the Commodore and the Nintendo. This is the best platform for playing these from, from that period of time. Uh, it's also just uh, what I like about it, uh, you know, I say it's a sequel, it's a sequel to a game called Night Law, which was the real revolutionary title. But I like this one better. It's it's like an open world sort of uh, puzzle game. You have to figure out which order to solve the rooms in as well as how to solve the rooms. Um, and they're all kind of 3D jumping puzzles. It runs pretty slow by modern tastes. So, but what you can do is actually speed up the emulator and play it as though this, the, the uh, ZX Spectrum was three times as fast as it was in reality. And then it approaches the playability of, of a console title. Mm. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll get. To, I think we have Night Lore uh, yes. in uh, other recommendations <laughs> as well. Um, and how about uh, Lords, Lords of Midnight? Uh, Mike Singleton uh, was was uh, interested in this idea of of taking the kind of board game, like the strategic board game scenario, and and turning it into kind of first person uh, views uh, and and sort of blending RPGs and board games in a certain way. This is a, this is a game uh, that I think is really interesting and that resonated well with our students when we forced them to to play it. Um, <laughs> if you imagine a game that is like a like a like a, a strategic turn-based game where you're playing a war game with multiple pieces but you're also playing an rpg where you are those pieces and you're commanding the battlefield from the first person perspective of the general and you're giving a bunch of orders and then your people move by day and the enemies move by night it's very very interesting it's just it's just quite unlike uh from a design point of view and from an aesthetic point of view this very very widescreen uh sort of like slice of the map that you're looking at it all the time makes it very, very unlike uh, any game before or since. And I, I just think it's cool from that point of view. I, I love how it looks and I, it's just very interesting. Yeah, this is one that, that I came to in, in modern times without, without nostalgia and is, is definitely one that once you get over the initial barrier of kind of getting used to the interface is, yeah, is this totally singular ex experience. It's very like, you're, you're Lord of the Rings, you're, you're, the, you're the big battle scenes in Return of the King, but also uh, 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 Frodo and yeah, yeah. Like, in, like, you're, you're do, like doing both of these things at the same time. So it's, yeah, it's really wild. Um, you'd also mentioned one of your recommendations that was like a, a maybe it, because it's so oh, yeah. weird. Um, <laughs> but I was like, oh, I obviously have to include it. So this is a game called uh, Deus Ex Machina by uh, Mel Proucher, who was this kind of uh, avant-garde, uh, one of the first uh, sort of avant-garde video game artists. He used to make little games and they would distribute them by playing the, the sort of digital signal of, of the game's data over pirate radio. So people would have to record it. And then, uh, so they'd have experiences like that. Uh, this, is a, this is a game that is a sort of a, it's like a, a loose psychedelic exploration of, of your voyage from, from being a kind of gay meat in the womb through to old age and death. And you play an audio cassette at the same time as you're playing the game, which has, uh, you know, chanting and music. Um, 
I think I think it's this one that actually has sort of like national treasures, uh, British National Treasure Act. Pat is, Patrick Troughton is the is the yeah. thing, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah. yeah, and and also uh, who's who's the actor who played uh, Saruman in, in Lord of the Rings? I forget. Um, Specifically, oh, he did the sequel. He was working on the sequel. I didn't know if the sequel. Was oh, he, I, I'm not sure if he's involved in this one, but yeah, he was part of that set as well. So they had this kind of set of intellectual artists who were getting together to to really, they really believed that video games could be this kind of like transformative new medium uh, in a way that was very sort of ahead of its time. It doesn't really deliver. It's not a fun thing, but it's kind of, it's it's really it's it's interesting. But, uh, yeah, this is an interesting one to look at. There is a um, iPhone version of it that was available, so you can, oh, you can have the experience that way. Uh, and how about uh, Saboteur? Uh, okay, this is uh, this is a game that I think is approachable. It's by a company called Durell that was uh, being able to bring like higher frame rate, more console console like experiences out of the Spectrum hardware. Uh, you're a ninja. You have to infiltrate a base, recover a disc, plant a bomb, and then escape by a helicopter. And so the whole thing is really more of a puzzle. Uh, than an action game. You have to try to unravel this map and figure out the correct way to approach it, which is a design that used to be overwhelmingly common on these platforms, but mm -hmm. is really, really out of vogue now. Like nobody, nobody really makes games that, more, that way anymore, where you, you're, the goal is to try to figure out the correct way to, to, to play them and then just to do it once. Mm -hmm. um, but it also is kind of height of 80s Ninja Mania, which was really had a death grip on the UK, particularly in, at about the time this game came out. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's good from that point of view. Uh, and another uh, Durrell games is uh, Turbo 3. This is, a, this is the, the, of all the, the driving games in history, it's the least like any other driving game. Your left and right buttons just make you change lane. Uh, you have to like hit the brakes and go left and right to, to turn, which you almost never do. But your, your, your goal is to sort of memorize the streets of London as you try to hunt down, um, I guess, uh, drug dealers uh, without harming any pedestrians. It's just strange that they were able to get so much fidelity out of such a weak machine. There's 3D buildings, there's people walking around that you can accidentally run over. Um, there's like a whole city map. It, it's just from, I, and I actually think it's pretty fun to play. Mm. Uh, and then, uh, Clara, I think this was one of uh, your recommendations is uh, Head Over Heels, another another isometric uh, kind of puzzle adventure. Yes, and I, I mentioned Night Law of Xenoverse. I was trying to guess what Bennett would choose. I'm like, that's going to be an ultimate game, the game somewhere. Uh, but Head Over Heels was part of that wave, you know. Uh, this I like, I like Head Over Heels by Ocean because um, what it does is, is First of all, it has a really interesting world. This is one of those games where the manual is setting up the whole world of like, there's like several planets and there's like an evil spider empress that you have to defeat by picking up you know, things in this world. You know, so they're kind of like an action adventure kind of genre. Uh, and here the, the protagonist head and heels are complementary. So you have two characters that have different abilities. Mm. One can jump and pick up things and the other you know has you know can run from one place to another they kind of do the same one of them can shoot a gun a donut gun uh so you're picking up donuts around the, the place but it's, it's very interesting because it's basically a 3d puzzle mm. uh adventure game it's really complex in only 48k and it's very charming uh and kind of like gets you going and gets you thinking about you know what you know what you have to do next it's also a large game i remember seeing in magazines the the, the map for this game people used to take you know pictures of each screen and then uh, glue them and the, the, those would go into a magazine and these were huge and the map of this game is actually pretty big mm -hmm. thanks to tiling thanks to to the way that it was programmed it was a really expansive world so so yeah this was you know it's, it's part of that school of we want to be ultimate as well but it's i think is one of the most the the, the most uh, dignified and actually fun uh rip off of what ultimate was doing mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and both of you kind of recommended around it, but I, I figured we would mention Night Lore as, as well as being this um, uh, it's, it's very influential, but still very, very playable. And, and, and I think one of the things that I, I like about it, or that's weird about it, is the sort of simulation aspect. You see in a lot of British adventure games where there's like, it's not just a, what we would today identify as adventure game. It, it also has all these little systemic elements, like the way that you turn into a werewolf at, at night and like, um, and also some yeah, fantastic UI. I really love the, the, the angled scrolls to account for the, the perspective of this. It's really nice. Um, all right, so our, our, um, our, our next system, I have a, I have a, a commercial to, to, to queue us up for. Um. This is the new Apple IIc. This is a computer they call Junior. You might think they're similar, but this one can only run this many programs, while the Apple IIc can run this many. 
pitiful that that junior. Uh, and so I, I the, a good a, a point to that um, the Apple IIc that like the, the original Apple II is from 1977, but it's like a ecosystem of different successor systems like the the the, the, the E, the C, the, there's like all these different ones that are like collectively the Apple II II family. Um, and so there's like uh, not necessarily the the, the initial one. Um, and so Naomi, you you picked out some some Apple II games um, for us, and the the first was uh, Task Task Times in Tone Town. Um, yeah, Task Times in Tone Town. Um, maybe the 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 hippest of eighty game eighties games in some ways. Uh, this is an adventure game. Uh, it follows kind of the old model where you have like big icons that represent all of the different verbs that you can do. Uh, and the plot, which you can't really see from this screenshot, is that your your uncle creates a portal to another world, which is uh, it's it's basically new wave the dimension. <laughs> right, so everything in this world is new wave. Um, everybody has new wave haircuts. There's new wave music playing, and in this world, your dog is a celebrity who can talk. <laughs> I don't know. If I really need to explain anything else about the game. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Um, and your your next one was uh, Sammy Sammy Lightfoot. This is uh, Sierra Online's attempt to clone Donkey Kong, uh, something that a lot of people have forgotten about. But I like this game a lot more than Donkey Kong uh, because they're trying to one-up Donkey Kong and doing it in a way that I think uh, really anticipates the Massacre games that came decades later. Uh, this game is extremely confusing. It's, it's not clear exactly how the physics work uh, or what's going to kill you. You have to figure it out by trial and error. And you play as this guy who's, who's kind of like wearing a evil Knievel style jumpsuit. I think he's supposed to be a circus performer. Uh, and you are trying to you're trying to get to the platform at the top of the level and that it itself took me a while to figure out like what is even supposed to be going on here uh, but there's something about the, the feel of this game the way the jumping works and the gravity that's actually quite well done for the time mm. um, how about, this is uh, the uh, Odyssey the complete adventure but complete spelled in a sort of grognardy way yeah c-o-m-p-l-e-a-t adventure um, this is one of the most epic, epic games for the Apple II in the early years. Uh, I think this came out in 1980. It's kind of a proto RPG. It's also an expedition game that, that I think anticipates some of uh, Sid Meier's Pirates in some ways. The idea is that you're assembling a crew of people very slowly over time and you're exploring this huge island, which is randomly generated, uh, but on the same map. Uh, and you're trying to amass wealth and also find all sorts of unusual items. It's not clear what they're for, uh, like, you know, monkeys and mirrors. You're just getting all of this stuff. Uh, and then halfway through the game, it turns out that, that what you're doing this for is to buy a ship. And then you get on the ship and suddenly you're in a completely different game <laughs> where you're sailing around on the ocean and uh, it has a very detailed sailing simulation that's also a little bit like Sid Meier's Pirates, right? Where you actually have to think about the wind and all of that. And it turns out that you're on this epic quest to defeat an evil wizard. And it, it kind of goes on and on and it keeps kind of unfolding and origami outwards. It turns out that you need to have that monkey in order to face like a certain challenge in the final level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's a, it's such a good example, I think, of, of how, like, genre conventions don't exist yet for most of these games. Yeah. So that, like, elements that we would, are like, oh, this is like an RPG, and this is like a simulation, this is like an adventure game, that would be weird if they were all mixed together now, or they're just, they don't, those conventions don't exist yet. So they have all these, all these kind of disparate elements. And it's, it's totally mixed together. Like, the, the creator of this game was just like, and you know what else I'm going to put in? A sailing game. And you know what else I'm going to put in? Uh, it's, yeah, it's a little bit like if uh, one of those AAA games with way too many systems was just made by one person. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, and you'd also recommended Aztec and Montezuma's Revenge, which are which are two two different but similar similar games. Yeah, this one is Aztec, which is the earlier one. I think this is maybe one of the granddaddies to you know to like all the Tomb Raider games and to games like Spelunky. It has a, it's a randomly generated dungeon. Um, where you have, you know, you have a tall character, right? This, this, there's only three floors in this because the character is much taller than in uh, than some of the later, like Spelunky or Mars and Revenge, but like a short little Mario style guy, right? But this game is, it's unrelentingly difficult. Uh, it's quite random. You never know whether there's going to be a snake in that basket or a treasure. Uh, there are just a lot of different enemies to defeat and you're bracing against time uh, to try and get to the bottom of this randomly generated tomb and recover the idol and bring it back out. Uh, it's, it's a very nicely difficult game. It has terrible feel and terrible controls, but that's like part of the experience. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of like, you're trying to like see if you can not fall through the staircase and land on the, on the alligator, especially because you can blow up the walls and stairs in this game. It's all destructible, which is, it was kind of mind blowing at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember like doing the thing where you're trying to crawl so that his hand is just over the edge of a ledge so that you can <laughs> drop an explosive on an alligator who's too flawed. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, and our and our last Apple II one was um, uh, Ultima Ultima Four, uh, which uh, Ben, this was your recommendation is one that like especially you need to read the, the manual. This is this is the one to like kind of in, engage with all the all the extra material. Yeah, I mean to Jesse's point about the feelies, this came with a cloth map. It doesn't have to be cloth, of course. You can look at a JPEG.
with a book of spells, which you were expected to read and memorize, and a book of monsters, and on top of that, an instruction manual. Mm. Uh, a lot of this game happens in your head. You, as you can see, there's not much room for text. There's not even much room for stats and numbers. But it's a game, it's maybe the first game to be interested in asking the player to make moral choices and mm. to set up a kind of RPG style system of morality that is uh, stood as like the most complex moral simulation, morality simulation, uh, well past the Bioshock days. Uh, mm. You know, it's, it's got some kind of complicated eight virtue system and you're expected to try to live up to all of them, even though they conflict. Um, it takes place in a big open world. There is a kind of a, a thin story, but a rich world to explore. Mm. And uh, this game it will give you a lot if you put in the effort to play it. Unfortunately, there's no real kind of modernization of this idea. So if you want to mm -hmm. experience uh, that kind of like morality simulation, like I'm saying, it's, 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 this is the game to go to. Mm. Um, that's the end of our, our Apple II. Uh, our, our next uh, platform is the, the Amiga, uh, which I have a, a, a great little commercial for. I am the Commodore Amiga 500 home computer. Dazzling animation at your command. I am the Commodore Amiga 500, a multitasking home office in your hand. I am the Commodore Amiga 500, total home video you control, and arcade quality games in stereo. And now, you can be everything I am. Oddly intimidating commercial, I, I find, uh, but but a good signal. This is this is sort of a different a period of time uh, than this is a 16-bit uh, computer, not a, not an 8-bit. Uh, so it's like the, the kind of next generation. So a little bit more, I think, a more accessible graphics at least to to, to, to modern players. Um, uh, and so um, uh, Ben, many of these are, are your recommendations. So we can we can just um, uh, jump into these. I think your first was a uh, cannon cannon fodder. This is a British game. So, I mean, it's worth like uh, just touching briefly. You saw the, the advertising that as a business machine. Uh, the American company making the Amiga was like desperately uh, keen not to be seen as making a gaming machine because of the Atari crash. They didn't want to lose all their investors. People were worried about games at the time. Uh, but in Europe, of course, there were no consoles. So it was treated just as a gaming uh, machine. So most of the, the, the important games, not all, but uh, most of the important Amiga games come out of Europe. This is British. Um, it's a satirical real-time war game uh, it's like squad based combat you control up to you know five or six little guys with the mouse and it's very arcadey it's, uh, it's a, sort of controls a lot like league of legends or something like that you click to move them around you right click to shoot um and you have to kind of like tactically i guess uh break down these maps and uh and kill all the enemies and complete the missions but it has overlaid on it this kind of uh you know war is hell type thing where all of your guys who die you, you know they don't come back and you have to see a memorial for them and you see their gravestones every time you start a mission uh and and you know like you're, you're trying to keep them alive just like in fire emblem or something like that um you know they get upgraded over time it's just uh it's fun it's playable it stands up this is a, this is a good one mm. Uh, and then uh, Paradroid, or this is Paradroid 90, the, the Amiga version. Um, both both you and Jesse uh, did a did a, a, a podcast with um, uh, Kanan, Kanan, Kanan Rince. Rince. Yep. Rince. I was going to say Kanan Lynch, and I was like, no. No, that's that's a different thing. That's a different podcast. Um, uh, the uh, Kanan Rince podcast uh, talking about there's there so there's a Commodore 64 version of this and and, and an Amiga version, um, and, and it was in both of your both of your your recommendations. Um, and so yeah, uh, tell us a bit about about Paradroid. Um, the Amiga version is much more playable, but it's not the original. Uh, I think to a modern audience, much more accessible. You're this little droid that is a paradroid in that it, it uh, can't do anything, but it can take over other robots. And your, your job is to kill, I don't know why, but to kill every single robot on this, this giant uh, uh, spaceship. Uh, and you have to, you know, the, the tactics of it is like, maybe I can more easily take over a weak service droid that carries cups on its head, but it doesn't have a very good gun, if any gun. Uh, so maybe I'll use that to get the, you know, the, the, the sentinel droid. Um, so like a lot of these computer games from the 80s and 90s, it's sort of because they couldn't pull off the highest frame rates and the best game feel, they tend to have more of a kind of a, a puzzle action uh, mm. characteristic to them. You're trying to solve the levels, um, a bit more like Hotline Miami or something like that, uh, and less like just enjoying this kind of moment to moment combat like you would in, in a, you know, a Japanese or American action game. Um, mm. So yeah, this is, this is like perfect example of, of one of those. Mm. And uh, a speedball too. This is one of my favorites of the, of the system. This is a uh, future sports game. We still have people still making these now in in the in the Steam and console era. Um, but it's you know it's a uh, it's European handball uh, played by people wearing armor, beating each other up. Uh, what I think is interesting about this game, apart, apart from the fact it is just actually a fun, uh, you know, high frame rate, well tuned action game. You can play uh, two players is the best way to play it. 
Um, it's a really great example of what I love about the Amiga, which is that it had this art styles, pixel art styles that fed through the Scandinavian demo scene and American graffiti art styles to produce mm. this really kind of um, particular approach to color and shading. And I think it's really interesting and it's something that um, people can and should uh, and maybe already do borrow quite heavily from in modern indie games. Um, this, this particular game is a, is a prime example of, of how an Amiga game looks in my head. Mm. Um, and how about uh, It Came From The Desert? This is one of my favorites. This is what we thought uh, interactive movies were going to be. Uh, we thought that, uh, so this is a, a company called Cinemaware, an American company that, um, that was concerned with trying to make interactive movies. They're trying to make a B movie uh, about uh, giant ants that get mutated by a radioactive rock. Um, yeah, it, it's like the way that they do it is that uh, it's, it's sort of a visual novel interspersed with action sequences that capture different things like an ant attack, flying a plane, driving a car, having a knife fight at the drive-in. And they're trying to give you just a little taste of everything to, to get enough of a sense of time and place. Mm. It's really That's interesting and it plays pretty well. And as a result, it's kind of hard to get a good representative screenshot for, for yeah. a number of these games because all of these different modes are so different. There's yeah, like it's not an FPS, but sometimes an ant will attack and you have to try to shoot it. Right, right, right. yeah, exactly. Um, and then our, our two last ones you recommended, Syndicate as well. Uh, Syndicate uh, is yeah, another squad-based uh, tactics game. Uh, it's sort of Blade Runner sort of style. It's that isometric 3D that we were looking at from the 8-bit uh, machines. This is uh, Peter Molyneux's uh, magnum opus, I guess. I really love this game. Uh, every mission is a little bit different. You maybe have to kind of capture a diplomat who's about to uh, be uh, limoed to a destination. And uh, you know, it, it's just a very complicated uh, simulation, but still plays really well. This was one that a, a friend had when I was in, in school and was, I was obsessed with going to their house to, to see the next mission um, at war. Uh, and then um, two, two last ones, Clara, this was one of yours is, is Captain Blood, um, which is on a, a variety of systems, but, but I, I think the Amiga and, and Atari ST are sort of the, the home ones. Um, do you want to give us a, a, a little information about this one? So Captain Blood is a French game, and I always say that it's very French. You know, the, the music was composed by Jean-Michel Jarre, which was all the way to the end of the 80s and with this, you know, synthesizer music. Um, but the interesting thing is that it's a game where you're exploring space. The, the, the galaxy is, is precisely generated, so you don't play the same game twice. And you can for yourselves, um, you have to land into uh, planets and talk to aliens and learn their language. And that's one of the most interesting things. You talk to the alien, you try to figure out what those symbols on the, on the screen mean, and you learn how to communicate with them so they get the information. Mm. This is one that I'm always recommending to students. It's like a like weird, interesting system, and and uh, it's like off-putting but like fun and bizarre. It's yeah, it's a, it's an excellent one, um, right? Um, all right, and our, our next uh, next platform, um, I, I believe, is the MSX. I have a I have a region appropriate uh, commercial for us. <laughs> Para algunos, un ordenador familiar es así, o así, o así. Para Sony, un ordenador familiar es así, sencillo, práctico y útil, para ordenar, estudiar, trabajar, jugar y para aprender juntos toda la familia. Los ordenadores Hitbit son compatibles MSX y pueden crecer. Es un Sony. Uh, so we're, this was a, this was an uh, uh, international platform. So there were there were commercials for this in, in every every region that it, that it released. So I, I grabbed a, I grabbed one from Spain, um, or alleged, according to YouTube. But, uh, <laughs> I uh, my, didn't remember this ad, but I guess that that's what, the, what that was the ad that we were sharing when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, well, the MSX was less a computer, more a computer standard. Mm -hmm. So it was it was kind of advancing the way that we have. Kind of like standards that different manufacturers can, can use. So Sony was making MSX computers, Toshiba was all in Japan, but Philips and Pioneer in Europe were also making Pioneers European or Japanese, I don't know. But there were also European manufacturers uh, making it, like there were a bit all, all over the place and they, they were following these standards. Mm. Uh, the same standard. And so, yeah, and so I think it's a really interesting one for modern American players, since unlike a lot of the systems we've seen that originated in America, even if they maybe had a bit bigger sales overseas, the MSX is one of the few computers that's like almost no American footprint. Uh, there, there are a few, I think there are a, a, a couple of developers, but it's mostly Europe and, and, and uh, in Asia where, where yeah. things are being made for this. Um, so your, your first recommendation is, is, a, is a classic. So, so most of the, the games that I'm recommending are Konami, because they are the ones that have withstood the, the passage of time, and some of them are versions of games that people might familiar with already um, but they were really different from the MSX mm. uh, and the first one is of course I had to talk about Metal Gear there's no solid just Metal Gear 1987 for the MSX 2 
yes, this is Kojima's first uh, game as a lead uh, that he actually inherited from somebody else. And the, what is interesting is that, first of all, if you play the NES, NES version, that's not the original. This is it. Um, the, the, the story premise, you know, is all there. Uh, but what is interesting, Kojima has talked about this, that it was the, the technical limitations of the MFX2 that led to the, the tactical spionage action because they couldn't have a lot of enemies moving. They couldn't have a lot of bullets on the screen. So it was a game where it was better to just be stealthy and not be caught because then it could not run. So, mm -hmm. so that kind of like trying to adapt around the limitations of the platform is, is what created the, the stealth genre that now you know, we all play. Um, there was a sequel, Metal Gear, Sol uh, Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake, that was only released for the MSX. It hasn't had any ports as far as I know. Hmm. Um, and then if you think about the Metal Gear Solid series, it was solid because it was going to be Metal Gear 3, like cube, like a solid. So that's where the title hmm. comes from. Uh, but yes, like this is, this is the origins of, of it, and it comes from the, the specific limitations of the MSX2. And you also recommended another Kojima game. Um, <laughs> well, this is not, so this is Antarctic Adventure, which was from 83, is one of the early Konami games for the MSX. And this is basically a reskinned racing game. So instead of a car, you have a penguin. And instead of having all the cars, you have to dodge seals and cracks on the ice. And you have to go from A to B within a specific amount of time. You're going from, to, to visit all the international stations in Antarctica. And that's the game. Uh, the interesting uh, part was the sequel, Penguin Adventure, where, which was Kojima's first game as an assistant. Mm. And that adds up a bunch of new mechanics. You know, there are uh, merchants and you can buy items that can uh, speed you up. You can fly over, um, you know, the seals and you can, um, you know, like avoid uh, obstacles. Uh, you can also get a gun for the, for the uh, penguin uh, <laughs> to kill enemies, apparently. Um, but, and you're also fighting dinosaurs. Uh, so that's kind of, and, and the premise is that you have to find this golden apple to rescue, um, to, to heal the princess uh, penguin. Um, so it becomes like very weird. It also has an impossible ending where like you can only win if you pause the game once, not twice, not never. Um, and it's kind of part of that weirdness. But uh, it's a game that's still very playable. But both of them are still, you know, really fun and really engaging. Mm. And you also recommended Vampire Killer, uh, which is, is one, uh, there's a lot of confusion around uh, some of the, the Konami games that are on MSX and on Nintendo, uh, because it's, it's Castlevania, uh, but, it, but, it, but it is also not at all uh, Castlevania. Exactly, yeah. So, so Vampire Killer, one day I'll, I'll learn enough Japanese to try to justify that this is the original game, although it's probably not. Uh, there was the arcade version, and this was developed in parallel to Castlevania. It was what we what could call now a launch title for the MSX, too. Uh, it was released along, uh, around the same time as the first MX2 machines were available. And, you know, one thing that is different is that while the Castlevania for NES has, you know, scrolling levels, this has, you know, an open world. You know, there's platforming, but the levels are really large. It's similar to, you know, Symphony of the Night, for example, you know, that thing that now we associate with, with the Metroidvania, it was doing it early on, uh, before even Castlevania figured it out. Mm. Uh, the only thing is that because of, again, technical limitations, you can only see one screen at a time of the large space. Um, but, but, you know, that was one of the, the sign differences. The other is that it has some RPG elements is that you can also find merchants. There was, Konami had this space where merchants were in all the games uh, and you can buy items apart from finding them in the, in the environment. But it was advancing things that you would see in later uh, Castlevania games in mm. 86. And you also recommend a shoot 'em up, the first kind of uh, explicitly arcade genre we, we've seen so mm -hmm. far. Yeah, and this is interesting because this was an exclusive title for MSX too, as far as I remember. There might have been other ports, but uh, shooters were not great in the MSX precisely because of frame rate, precisely because you could not have uh, as many um, sprites on screen as, as one would expect with a shooter game. Uh, this one is is usually acknowledged. This is not a Konami game, by the way. The company was called Compile. Um, and what is cool is that you start the game and there are these cutscenes that are like anime cutscenes. And it's for the time it was really, really spectacular. You have, you know, a female protagonist and you're like kicking ass, fighting aliens. Uh, and it's also like it's very smooth. This was towards the end of the the, 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 the life of the MSX2, like as a, as a kind of like blooming platform, uh, as, as Jesse was saying before, you know, this was when people had figured out how to make the best out of the MSX2 graphics and how to do this. So it still plays really well. It's like really smooth and really, really cool. Um, and uh, uh, lastly, you recommended uh, The Maze of Galliolus, which is a, a, a rare, uh, this is a very influential uh, uh, one. 
yes, this is a sequel to a game called Nightmare, Nightmare with a K. Um, that was also a thing in the 80s. Um, and uh, this is a kind of open um, platform, had a huge map, kind of like Castlevania as well. Um, and this also had, you know, two protagonists who had different items and they had access to the to the you know, maze uh, from different places. And it was really complex because it was platforming, it was you know, RPG elements, finding out items, using items in a specific way. Each character could not use the same items. There were things that one character was better at than, than the other. Uh, and it, it was, it's been very influential in games like Glamulana, which was playing a direct homage to, to the Maze of Gallius. Mm. Yeah, I think it was such a, it's a like Metroidvania sort of, sort of mold, this, this kind of like map you're exploring and backtracking and, and collecting items and, um, uh, and, and, and very accessible to, to play today. I, I think it's, it's really a lot of fun. And full of secrets, um, right? There is a kind of aesthetics yeah. of secrets in, in games of this era that does not exist now in the YouTube era where everything mm. is spoiled. Uh, you know, so, so I, I think it's always interesting for people now to, to play games which are just packed full of like secrets or like even entire other games hidden within games. Uh, something we used to love in the 80s that has mm. almost died away completely. Mm. Uh, and, and Ben, you had an MSX uh, recommendation as well, which was uh, Peng Penguin Coon Wars. Yeah. This is one I've just found. Sorry, sorry it's the one that I left out of my, in my list. <laughs> <laughs> so this game, uh, it's, it's, like a, it's just two-player dodgeball, I guess, is really the design. Um, you're trying to throw balls past the other person or hit them to stun them. Um, but it's really just, it's, it's fun in a way that makes it more accessible than nearly everything else uh, on the MSX. And I, I find that when people get given this game to play, even uh, contemporary players who didn't grow up with this kind of thing, they tend to love it. Uh, so yeah, definitely worth a play. Mm. But, yeah. um, okay, so then, uh, so yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at the, the, the original Macintosh. Um, and I have my short ad for... Introducing Macintosh. It does all the things you'd expect a business computer to do. It does a lot of things you wouldn't expect a business computer to do. And it does some things no other business computer has done. It goes on done. for a while talking about all of its great business capabilities. Um, uh, but yeah, we're, we're talking about the, the games on it. Uh, this is like a, a, a sort of like a lost history, the, the early games on the, on the Macintosh and uh, like a, a lot of really great um, examples on this game and, and, uh, on the system and so visually distinctive as well. Um, uh, Jesse, you'd made the, the point about this like one bit uh, kind of art style. Uh, it's just uh, it's like there's a resurgence in, in interest in it. And so, so it was worth taking a, a look at. Um, uh, 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 both, both Jesse and, and then you recommended the fools fools Aaron. This is just like a, a, a classic. Uh, did, did uh, either of you want to tell us about this? It's just incredibly good. Like you can play it today, and it's just as good as it was. And it really uses every possible part of the game. Like it is made by an artist. It is made by a person who does puppets and animation, and mm. like just a polymath, and who is uh, knows nothing about computer games, and just puts all of their energy into making this like very perfect game where every aspect of it matters. Uh, and often you get stuck in a puzzle because you're like, well, that can't matter. And it does. And then you solve it. I think it's really, sorry, it's what we think of as an indie game, I think really mm. importantly. And you know it's an indie game because he spent 25 years working on the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> True. You can only get it by paying the guy directly. It's not a platform. Um, and uh, 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 Ben, you'd also recommended Dark Castles uh, when, you, when you talked a lot about uh, before. This is the Macintosh's answer to, to uh, Prince of Persia. It's, uh, as far as I know, the first was the and mouse game. So you aim uh, the mm -hmm. guy's throwing arm and throw rocks with the mouse and you make him move around and run using WASD in space. Um, it has action feel unlike any other game now in a way that contemporary students find almost impossible to deal with. Uh, but it's, it's a beautiful game and, uh, and, and, and just aesthetically has just a huge amount of style. Mm. Yeah, it's one in the uh, NYU Games Center library where we have an, a vintage Macintosh playing this on the original hardware. The the art is like really astound, like just astoundingly good. The the just the I, I'm sure uh, this will in how this gets um compressed. We'll, we'll we'll mush together a lot of pixels, but uh, it's it's really really beautiful. Um, and you also recommend Deja Vu. This is a, like a, a Mac Mac Venture, I think, is, is part of that that series. Yeah, so this 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 series of Mac Venture games uh, had the idea well. You know, they've given us this nice um, API for making windows and dragging icons around and like every, you know, every, what if every part of the game is an icon that can be dragged by the mouse and so your inventory is a window full of like uh, little draggable icons that you can drag around in, inside of like containers and stuff and then moving around you do from another little sub window and um, that just gives it a very strange feel. It's a, it's, it's a, in, like a noir detective story. You wake up not having any idea who you, who you are and uh, uh, you're trying to sort of unravel a mystery. Um, 
still playable now. I, I knew about this game in the 80s, but only played it a couple of years ago and I played it through and it stands up super well. Mm. And uh, Jesse, you'd recommended uh, An Ego Gets Out. This is, this is like a, a relatively deep cut, uh, I, I think. Uh, I mean, it was, it was very influential because it was talked about by game designers and a big influence on uh, Loom, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a, a LucasArts game that had a very minimal UI. Uh, by Brian Moriarty. And yeah, it's, it's a hyper card game, right? It is an early hyper card. You can play it in about three minutes. Uh, it's very charming. Uh, you follow a cat around and you click on things. And, um, but yeah, I mean, it's sort of here to stand in for checking out hyper card in general, which was, you know, this uh, very accessible, very uh, flexible kind of system uh, for people making their own games and database stacks and other, you know, pre World Wide Webby uh, kind of stuff. And yeah, there's a uh, uh, Amanda Goodenough made several sequels to it. You can you can find those as well. They're all very very charming and yeah, certainly the most accessible games we've covered probably because you just you click on the cat and it does not Yeah, and these and this the the hypercard. Uh, I feel like there's been increasing interest in recently uh, in, in preserving them and, and stuff like that. And yeah, so uh, imaginative. The uh, the manhole is the other other great one by um, yeah. Randall Robin Miller. Is like I, I was really surprised at just how like interesting and fun it is. Out of just uh, pictures that have hotspots that you click on right. that lead to the pictures. Like that's the only mechanic, but they get so much mileage out of it. Um, and you'd also mentioned, you'd also recommended Shufflepuff Cafe. This one is on a lot of other platforms, um, but the, the like Macintosh one's like the, I think the original and, and best. Yeah, and I think, I mean, one thing that distinguishes the Mac from all the other features we've talked about is there's no joystick, right? I, maybe you could, I'd never have seen a joystick attached to a, a Mac. Uh, and so if you want to play action games, they'd either be keyboard and mouse like our castle or just mouse, right? And Shufflepuff Cafe, it very much feels like a game designed to teach you how to use a mouse, kind of, mm -hmm. you know, like it is about, in the same way that Breakout is about a paddle or Marble Madness is about a trackball, Shuffle Puck is the pure mimesis of like, I move the mouse and the puck moves. And if I move the mouse fast, I hit the puck fast. Uh, it also has um, the, the animations are very charming. You fight, uh, you fight, you face different aliens that each have different quirks. Uh, and I think the guy's name was Gene Portwood. He also worked on Carmen San Diego. This is a Broderbund game. And he had a career like as a Disney animator in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and so, yeah, there's, there's a very clear charm that comes through. The Amiga version is also good, but I think the Mac is probably the one to play. Mm. Yeah, I, love, I think this, it's this uh, opponent who starts out with like the best AI, but as he gets drunk, he gets really- Every time he makes a shot, he- Yeah, first, yeah he gets worse. Oh, such a good mechanic. Um, and uh, you also are going to Hidden Agenda is one of my, my uh, favorites uh, as well. Yeah, I think this is probably in the 80s class. I have students, you know, they write critical play reports every week. And I, I think this is the number one game, honestly, in terms mm. of just best reviewed, most consistently, everyone who plays it really likes it uh, and writes something interesting about it. And yeah, it's a fascinating game where you are the newly elected Democratic president of Chimerica, a fictional Central American country in the 80s. Uh, and it's kind of a mix of choose your adventure and sim. I mean, there's like, there's numbers in their systems, but you're, you're talking to people and choosing, you have a bunch of advisors, you choose things based on that. And it really just does like, you feel screwed from every direction. That sounds like when you are playing this game, it really just gives you the sense of like, there is no good answers to any of the stuff that I'm confronting uh, and how you deal with it. And, and, and also the idea that your advisors, you may tell them to do something, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to do that thing because mm. they may have a hidden agenda. Uh, and so certainly as compared to most sim games, which are much more solipsistic power fantasies in the sense of just like I control the city and I set this and I zone that and the things happen. Uh, this is actually in a lot of ways, even though it is rougher because it is more of a choose your own adventure kind of structure almost. Uh, but yeah, a, a really compelling game, really well researched, really interesting. And yeah, definitely you can play it on DOS, uh, but the graphics look way better. Uh, mm. They're mostly like still photos of people and stuff like that. And they just look way better on the map. Mm. Um, and you also recommended um, uh, Chris Crawford's Balance of Power. Yeah, I mean, as far as for games go, I might even say Sibut, but this does feel mm -hmm. like the one to check out. And it also has an entire book he wrote about the uh, underpinnings and assumptions behind the systems. So if you're kind of interested in looking at these from a more academic or like kind of diving into it, like this is an incredibly rich text. Uh, and it's essentially, yeah, very much a game designed around the Apple, the Mac UI, the drag and drop windows. It was kind of a big hit. It got a, a, a very intellectual New York Times article about it as, you know, a game for adults. Uh, and it's, it's not the most exciting thing in the world because you are just kind of looking at a lot of charts and like kind of assessing things out. Uh, but it is a game where you're either the US or the USSR. You're trying to basically maintain your prestige without uh, going through DEF CON 1 and nuclear war, in which case it gives you a screen where Chris Crawford chastises you and says, you're not going to get a fun graphic of people blowing up because you failed. 
Yeah, it's, it's a really, uh, really interesting uh, one in that it looks like a war game, war strategy game. Like it has the maps, it has all the like the the things that you associate with a with a war strategy game. But that like war is the lose state in this. It's like a diplomacy. Well, uh, well like, it is. A, it, I mean, it's a war game. It's just a soft war game. Right, right. right. So there's insurgencies and foreign military aid and threats and brinksmanship. But right, you, the, the nukes, the nukes make a difference. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, and and uh, that that brings us to the, the end of our our, our our whirlwind tour of a, of a couple of different uh, different systems. Um, so, like I, I uh, mentioned, um, I've got a, a website uh, where where I put on all of our, our recommendations, uh, so it would be easier to to access there. Um, uh, but yeah, I I think um, uh, uh, so like a, a a great a great kind of place to start for a lot of these different different systems and, and seeing kind of these game design streams um, that are that are not around uh, not around today. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you all so much for for your time, and your your recommendations, um, and um, uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks, uh, thanks so much for your uh, for your time. Uh, I guess we'll yeah, because we'll see see you later. It's weird because we're pre recording, so it feels like, uh, but but uh, we'll see you all later. Uh, bye, bye, bye everybody. Bye.